What's up, and welcome to Clarity for Parents of Athletes, bringing you stories from professional athletes about their parents and how they were raised. My name is Gabe Nocer from aclearmind.com. All right, and welcome to episode number 20. I hope you're enjoying all of the podcast episodes so far. I've interviewed some amazing athletes who are amazing people as well. And I ask you that if you like Clarity for Parents of Athletes, that you please rate, review, subscribe, and to share the podcast so more people can become aware of it and can be just as inspired as you are, hopefully, by the stories of these athletes. And of course, everything is all for the purpose of helping today's parents and ultimately their children who are uh, participating in athletics. And I want to remind you that I also do workshops for teams and also the parents of the teams. Uh, I do those in person with the goal of helping the groups achieve a higher level of performance, whether they're the athletes or higher level performance as parents as well. I also work with individuals and small groups. I do that all virtually on the phone and I do that with the intention of doing the same to operate with more of a clear mind, which leads to a higher level of performance. You can find more information about what I do on my website, aclearmind.com. Now, this interview is broken down into two separate episodes, a part one and part two. This is part one of the interview, and the guest is Mohini Bahardwaj, who is an Olympic silver medalist in gymnastics in the 2004 Olympic Games in Athens, and she's the first Indian American to medal in gymnastics and the second Indian American ever to medal in anything. And her journey in her athletic career is a really unique one. She left home at her own at 12 years old and eventually represented the U.S. in the Olympics after she spent a year in retirement from gymnastics after her days at UCLA. I'll leave you my takeaways at the end of part two of the interview, so please keep listening after Mohini and I wrap up in part two, and I'll tie in what impacted me the most in hopes that it does the same for you and will benefit your child as well. All right, enjoy. All right, so Mohini, uh, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time today. Oh, you're welcome. I'm excited to to be a part of this. Yeah, so I, I... I want to get to know you a little bit more. I, I know for a lot of people, you're probably a name they'll remember just like I did from the past, but haven't thought about in quite some time. So in order to get to know you outside of gymnastics, I want to get back into your family history with you, siblings, parents, all that. Now I know for myself personally, I went to middle school with somebody who had Bahardwaj's uh, last name as well. So I know he was East Indian. I imagine you come from some kind of East Indian descent as well. Yes, I am. My mom's actually Russian um, and my dad is Eastern Indian. Hmm. Nice. And going to your family, brothers, sisters, where'd you grow up, all that stuff. Um, I have one brother who I think is a year and a half younger than me. Um, And I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. I actually, well, I actually grew up a little bit of everywhere because I moved for training um, when I was around 12, 13-ish. So, um, but until, until 13, I, I was living in Cincinnati. And where'd you go after that? Um, in 92, I moved down to Orlando, Orlando to attend a gym called Brown's Gymnastics. Um, in the early 90s, if you were a good gymnast, it was kind of what you did. You moved to Um, better gyms that produced Olympic caliber athletes. Um, That was kind of a 90s thing. And now there's more coaches that are, um, I think, better equipped. People don't have to move as often. Um, So I was in Orlando for about a year and a half living with another family. And then after that year and a half, my mom moved down. And then my coach built a gym in Houston 
And so I ended up moving to Houston. My mom ended up going back to Cincinnati. Um, so I moved to Houston to train at Browns Houston. Mm. So, you know, to backtrack a little bit, how old were you when you started gymnastics and did you play other sports besides that? Or was that just it? Um, so I started gymnastics when I was five. Uh, I wanted to start earlier, but my mom wouldn't let me. And then <laughs> she busted me bouncing on the bed and trying to flip off the bed onto pillows. And she's like, okay, I've got to do something. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I did do some other sports. Um, I actually won the junior Olympics for roller skating. Um, wow. I did a cartwheel on my skates. I was pretty proud of that cartwheel with roller wow. skates on. Um, and then I think when I was about nine, it got to the point where my gymnastics training hours had increased and I had to make a decision because I just couldn't do, do both. So you were pretty good at a young age, I imagine. Yes, I, I was. I was fairly good when I was younger. I'd say I was, I was talented, but I didn't really learn the work ethic. Um, I probably not until I got into college. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're good and athletic at a young age. How did you get even introduced to gymnastics and who'd you get the athleticism from? Um, I honestly think it was just a kid on the playground, you know, when I was in kindergarten or first grade. Um, the athletic background, my mom was a professional ballet dancer. Um, she danced in Winnipeg um, when she was, I don't know, in her, in her early 20s. And then my dad was actually the captain of his cricket team in India. So mm. that's the background that I know of. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, that is a unique background for sure. Uh, so what, what was their relationship like with you while you were going on your journey as a gymnast? Um, my parents were always really, really supportive. Um, my dad was always busy working, so he did more of the funding, whereas my mom would attend competitions and um, shuffle me to and from gym. Um, I think that's kind of kind of was the standard in the 80s. Um, but they always supported me. And when I was 12 and I had this dream to make the Olympic team, it was myself that wanted to move. And I remember arguing with them and trying to persuade them to let me go. Um, and for them, it wasn't something that they were used to. There were other kids in the gym that had gone to Orlando and then had come back and then had left again. So when I actually, when we were actually able to, to go there, I went with another girl from my gym. Um, so they had been able to talk to a couple of other parents that had done this with their, with their children. Mm -hmm. So they were, thought you were maybe a little crazy, like, no, like you have to stay here. <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, I was 12, so they were just probably <laughs> thinking that I was young and what, what am I thinking? But then at the same time, it was something that I really wanted to do. And they were both like, why don't we just give it a chance? For, for a year and see and see how, how she does and how she progresses. Um, and after that first year that I was down there, I ended up making national team. Um, so I obviously, it was obviously worth it or mm -hmm. they felt like it was worth it. Mm -hmm. So you said you, you felt this pull, you wanted to move basically when you had this goal to make the U.S. Olympic team. Do you remember that moment where you said, I want to be an Olympian. And what was the catalyst that propelled you to think that way? I think it was watching the 84 Olympics um, with Mary Lee Retton. Mm. And I was like, wow, I'm good. I can do some of that stuff or I want to do that. Huh. So that's kind of, kind of what motivated me. Huh. Yeah, those role models that we see on TV, usually that's what pushes the kids. You know, it's rarely the parents that are like, you're going to be an Olympian. But I think that does exist out there. And you've probably seen that in your work, which we'll, we'll get to later after your story. So <laughs> how was it? You know, one question that came to mind is I know there's so much focus on academics for a lot of cultures, especially I've had a lot of East Indian friends and that I went to school with and academics is such a focus on their development and such a priority. What was that like for your father to be like, all right, yeah, go ahead. Let's pursue this gymnastics thing. 
Well, I wasn't allowed to do gymnastics unless I had good grades. Mm. So it was, that was still, still the priority. Um, and even training at that high level, I mean, it was, you don't have good grades. <laughs> you can't do this. Yeah. So. Yeah. Did you have a relationship with the family in Orlando before you went? Did you know them at all? Or were you just, that's who you had? Uh, no, I did not know them. They were a family that I guess boarded kids. Um, that sounds kind of bad. I guess house them. <laughs> <laughs> These days you have to be careful with your words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, they'd housed several kids and the gym had a whole system worked out. So it wasn't really too much of an issue. Um, but I think I, I had the hardest time just moving into a completely different household. Um, my household was very, I don't know, Indian. We ate Indian food, you know, and we did, we, you know, went to temple. And so I'd never stayed or lived with people that weren't doing the same things as me. So it was a little bit of a culture shock for me. Yeah. I, I could imagine. So what was your family in Orlando like? Um, well, they were, they were okay. They just weren't, weren't my family. And <laughs> again, I was, I was leaving home when I was 12 and my mom took dinner every single day and did my laundry and, and those just things that you can do on your own when you're 12, but I just didn't have time to do it between school and gymnastics. And so <clears throat> I had to do, I had to learn a lot of that stuff and, and t- take on some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good way to grow up pretty quickly, you know. Yeah. So you're there at 12 years old, which is pretty young, you know, especially in the U.S. culture to just send your child to go. But it seems like that was somewhat normal in in the gymnastics circuit. So I think you're, you said your mom went down about a year later. So then I imagine you guys had your own place, right? Yeah, about a year and a half after I'd been down there, she ended up moving down with my brother. Mm -hmm. And how was your focus as a gymnast at 12 years old? Well, I think I, I I told you that, you know, I was talented, but I didn't really learn work ethic. Mm -hmm. Um, I could put in the time at the gym. Um, I worked on fixing things, but I don't like looking back and I really didn't realize this until after I'd gone to UCLA, I really wasn't combining mind and body and really trying to make certain corrections. Um, I would more or less get a correction from my coach and kind of just nod instead of actually implementing it or really thinking about how to connect that. Mm. Um, And I think that's something you do get with age. Mm. Um, But, but for the most part, I was a hard worker. I put in the time. I just, didn't really hone in on making my best effort on every single turn, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, they're developmentally at, at, you know, 12 year olds at a certain level. And obviously you're absolutely correct as they develop in their brains, then they're able to grasp more things, especially at a critical level. Now I'm, I wonder, was there a difference when you were 12 to when a year and a half later, your mom showed up, did you see a difference in your performance having her in your life down in Orlando and versus not having her before when you were just living with that family? Oh yeah. I think it was, it was definitely totally different. I, I think that um, my personal life felt more comfortable. My home life felt more comfortable. Um, again, she would help do my laundry and cook dinner and, and I would get, you know, good sleep and that's important and good food. I mean, all that stuff's important when you're training to feel your body correctly and, and have those recovery days. And I felt like I got more of that with my mom around, but that's because she's my mom and she's going to do that. You know, she wanted to do everything that she could in her power to support me so that I could practice and, and do well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it totally makes sense that you have a very strong support system at home and someone to go home to after the gym that you can connect on a deep emotional level. Whereas before it was just all about the gym and you're with this family that's caring for you, but it's you don't have the depth of your soul at the same connection that you do with your family. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, it totally makes sense. So 
you said you guys moved over to Houston. Did you guys move together or was it just you in Houston? It was just me in Houston. Mm. And how old were you at that point? I was about 16, um, maybe turning 17. And I had moved to Houston because my coach in Orlando um, built a better gym. And the head coach at that gym was Alexander Alexandrov, who was the 1992 Olympic coach for the Russian team. And they took gold in 92, and he had moved over to the U.S., and she had hired him. So that was the reason behind my move was, was the mm-hmm. coach. Mm-hmm. And how was that experience for you being now 15, a little older than when you were in Orlando, but still really a child? Although I'm starting to see a pattern in gymnastics that just because you're 15, you're not really a child anymore. It's almost like you're an adult at that point. Yeah. Well, I was actually, I was actually at least 16 because I know I was driving. (laughs) Okay. Um, And, and the experience was, it was, it was a lot. So I had a nice apartment that was down the hall from the front desk front desk lady and um, one of the compulsory coaches. And they actually lived in the owner of the Houston gym's house. And Rita, she lived in Orlando. So she would go between Orlando and Houston. So it wasn't like I was living completely by myself because they were just kind of down the hall from me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, again, that's why my mom felt comfortable enough to, to let me go. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then again, I was I was 16 and I was driving and I had my own apartment. Um, yeah. So there were other things that other things that came with that. Um, I went to a private school when I was in Orlando. I had been to a public school, um, and so I, I went to this private school. It was very very small. They work with athletes um, and different high school age children that, that were models and there was equestrian national champion. So they worked with people that had very difficult schedules with a lot of travel and stuff like that. So the school part was, was really, really nice because some of my classes were one-on-one. Sometimes it was like a student teacher ratio of one to four. So education wise, I think I did totally fine, but I was also the 16 year old that, that had an apartment and everybody knew about it. So Mm. it was, I had a lot of a lot of high school <laughs> friends that, that wanted to hang out all the time and I had practice and I also would have practice at six thirty in the morning. So um there were certain things that kept me in line. Um mm-hmm. but I can definitely say that that I was irresponsible at times and um some of that high school life took precedence over my training. I would skip practice every once in a while. Um, And again, that's back to the work ethic that I didn't think I developed until I was a little bit older. Um, So it it was, it was a lot of fun. um, And it was a lot of training. I was training 42 hours a week. So I would go practice from 630 to 930. And then I'd go to school from 10 to one. And then I'd be back at practice from three to seven. And Wednesdays, I only had morning practice. And then I also had practice on Saturday. So it was a very busy schedule. And, um, I couldn't get myself into too much trouble because, because of that busy schedule. Wow. That's a full-time job at 16 years old. Yes, it is. Yeah. Wow. Um, and this was, or this was 1995. So 94, 95. So it was the year before 95. So it was, it was the year before the 96 Olympics. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that's really what, what kept me in line and motivated because I mean, this was what I thought was my only shot to make an Olympic team. Mm -hmm. So I really thought I put everything in that I possibly could, but then occasionally I'd skip practice here and there. And so in the back of my mind, I know that those things are the things that perhaps are the reasons why I didn't make the 96 Olympic team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was that Olympic trial like for you? Oh, I feel like I barely remember it. <laughs> um, I I had a good, I know I, I had a good year. I had a good meet, um, but I ended up missing the Olympic team by 0.075, mm. um, which is just very, very small. Um, 
And I, I was, I know that I was like really devastated and upset that I didn't make it. But I also thought in the back of my mind, I don't know if I'm good enough to make this team. Mm. So there were, there were some athletes ahead of me. I think they took the top seven and I was 10. Mm. Wow. So did you have this thought that maybe I'm not good enough before the meet, during the meet or after the meet or all, all, all the whole time? I, I, I think just kind of throughout the whole year. Um, at this point in gymnastics, we had um, two different days of competition. So we had a compulsory day which everybody did the same exact routine and it was very technique based. Um, very focused on dance and body positions and flexibility and lines. And, and then the second day we had optionals, which is basically your optional day of competition, which is basically everybody has their own individualized routines. And when you're an optional, you can pick and choose what skills and what kind of dance and what kind of things you do to really highlight the type of athlete you are. Um, I was more of a power athlete, um, better at floor and vault. And so the compulsories is kind of where, where I struggled um, because I wasn't a beautiful, elegant dancer. Um, and so, so I, knew that that was, I knew that that was the one thing that would probably hold me back. I would usually finish um, like 12th to 15th on the compulsory day. And then I'd end up finishing like third or fourth, the optional day. And what they do is they average those um, to pick the team. And so I think I just kind of knew the whole year because I was struggling with those compulsories. Mm -hmm. And so that meet, how do you end up after the first day on that for the Olympic trial or Olympic team meet? I'm pretty sure I was 15th and mm -hmm. then I finished fourth for optionals and then averaged out to, to 10th. So, you know, and, and you never know what's going to, you never know what's going to happen because they count everything. And so if somebody falls, that makes a big difference, you know? Mm -hmm. So, or if somebody's injured, that makes a huge difference. Um, somebody has a mistake. So that's yeah. kind of, I think yeah. it, it leaves the door, it leaves the door open in your mind. You know, right. maybe, maybe I can, you know? Yeah. But I, you know, without knowing too much about gymnastics, 0 0.075, it can mean you, your arm was in a weird spot for half a second or something. I imagine it comes down to little things like that, right? Yeah, it's really small. Like um, a half a tenth is you not having your toes pointed in a, in an element that you, you do. Mm -hmm. So, Man. So you didn't make the team, and I imagine that was pretty devastating for you. What was your family's response to you? How did they support you? Um, well, I, like, I don't know that the Olymp like, they were more excited that I was going to get a college scholarship. <laughs> 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 I mean, I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of how you look at it. Like you miss the Olympic team, but you get to go to college and do gymnastics in college. And that's huge. That's, it's not like better or just as good, honestly. And so I think that's really the route they took was, was look, you worked really hard and this didn't work out. But, you know, you have the opportunity to, to do gymnastics at UCLA. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think for them, that was, that was really exciting going, going back to, you know, educational background and that kind of stuff with being Eastern Indian and how important that is. Mm -hmm. um, my, my dad was still you know, ex elated and excited. Yeah, I bet. So what was your college recruiting process like? I can imagine as somebody who barely missed out on the Olympic team, like you had probably a lot of offers, right? Um, I did. And, you know, I, I knew when I was younger that I wanted to go to UCLA. And this kind of ties into the 84 Olympic Games because the 84 Olympic Games were in Los Angeles and gymnastics was held in Poly Pavilion. And so ever since I was young, um, I was always telling myself, well, I just want to go to UCLA um, because of that. And because, you know, Los Angeles is beautiful. There's so many opportunities, you know, California, it's um, all sounds great to, to a 17 year old. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. It's uh, pretty good weather they have there, beaches, everything. So, and a really good academic school as well. Yeah. 
And I mean, I, I was the number one recruit for my year. So there really wasn't anything that I had to do for the recruiting process. A lot of kids now um, go through consulting services and stuff like that to ensure they get a scholarship or to get the best opportunity they, they can. Um, I didn't really have to do much of that. Um, so it was relatively easy for me. Yeah, they just, the coaches knew you from the circuit already, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you got the pick of the litter then for you. Uh, um, so what was your college career like? Um, I had an amazing college career. Um, I, I think 11 time All American and four time NCAA champion. Two of those were team, one was floor, one was bars. Um, we, Pac-12 champion two years in a row, which I think is, well, it was Pac-10 back then. Nobody's beaten that record. So I, I set, set a lot of records. I had a lot of good accomplishments, um, but I did go through some, some crazy stuff my freshman year, just kind of trying to get back on track. I gained my freshman 15 and did a little bit too much partying. And so my freshman year, I actually only got to compete towards the end of the season. Um, I had, had gained a lot of weight and taken um, a short landing and ended up fracturing my ankle. So I was out for, for part of the season. Um, so, so I think that was probably the biggest part. Um, and then being on my own and not having somebody to make sure that I go to class and that kind of stuff, I skipped a lot of class. And I actually ended up with a really low GPA my freshman year. Mm. And Miss um, Dow and the coaches had to sit down with me, and I was subject to dismissal. And I had to have that reality check of, you know, this is your job. Essentially, we are paying you to do gymnastics, and you have to carry this certain GPA. And there's no exceptions. There's nothing we can do. It's time for you to step up and be an adult and be a good student athlete. And I think just that alone, you know, just scared me because mm -hmm. um, I definitely didn't want my parents to find out. And that was another thing. They're like, you're an adult. We're not going to call and talk to your parents about this. You know, you, you need to deal with it in the most appropriate manner. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I went through that. Um, I had one um, assistant coach that I, I swear I probably wouldn't have graduated college without him. He mm -hmm. used to stand at my 8 a.m. class and make sure that I showed up for my class. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, and he actually was at UCLA. He, he just retired. It was, it was Randy Lane. He had left mm. and, and come back. But essentially, he was, he was the reason. And he would get up at 5 a.m. because he lived, lived in Santa Barbara and would drive all the way to campus to be there at my 8 a.m. class. Mm. Um, so I think, I think just having that person there holding me accountable mm. and somebody, like, he was just so willing, like, no questions asked. He was just... 5 a.m. and then 8 a.m. at my class. So I think having him really validate that he believed in me and thought that I was worthwhile, I think that really made a huge impact on me um, and really motivated me to do to do better my sophomore year. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes we need that in our lives. Now, you know, a couple things came to mind. Number one, you know, you were already living on your own in Houston and attending class, although you did say, if memory serves me right, you did say you missed class a few times. So mm -hmm. you were essentially kind of always your accountability partner in Houston. So what do you feel is the difference between Houston and when you went to UCLA as far as your discipline at partying or not partying or going to class or not going to class? Well, I think it was different because you were around a lot of student athletes. Um, when I was in Houston, I lived on my own. Um, my freshman year of college, I was in the dorm. So I think it was more of that temptation with people saying, oh, we're going to go out and do this. Do you want to come? And I had a hard time saying no, because when I was training in Houston, I was training 42 hours a week. And then all of a sudden in college, you're down to, to 20 hours a week. Mm. Um, so, so I think that that was part of it. And also the last year that I was living in Houston um, from 96 to 97, after I missed that Olympic team, um, I, I wanted to 
and I, I got my scholarship to UCLA and I wanted to take the year off. Um, and my parents wouldn't let me take the year off. They wanted me to continue and train. Um, and that's not really what I wanted to do. So I skipped a lot of practice that year. Um, and it got to the point where my dad had me move in with another family and got rid of my apartment <laughs> because mm. I wasn't, I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and I was with that family for about six months, maybe a little bit longer. And then I ended up moving back to Orlando and training with my, my coach in Orlando, um, Rita, I ended up living with her and I ended up training and I think finishing third at nationals and then making the 97 world championship team. Um, so I had some background of, you know, not really doing what I was supposed to do. My parents made me follow through. Mm -hmm. um, I almost feel like had I taken that year off, um, it would have been a better life experience for me. I never had a year off. I just wanted to not compete. It wasn't that I didn't want to train. I was still committed to, to training through to college. But I think that they were worried if I didn't compete, then I would lose my, my skills for college. Mm -hmm. So did you have arguments, I imagine? saying, you know, during this time where you wanted to take some time off and they wanted to have you keep going? Yes. Um, and it was very much like you need to follow through with what you started was what my parents were saying. And then what I was saying is I just want to be a normal, you know, high schooler, a normal, normal teenage person. Um, and I mean, in the end, in the end, I followed through and finished. Um, but I still wish I had, I had that, that time. But I know my parents did it for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I respect that reason. I mean, I, as a coach, I have team athletes. And when they sign on to my team, I make them sign a contract saying that they're going to stay for the whole season because I think it's very important that you fulfill and follow through with your commitment and your goals and your commitment to your team. Mm -hmm. And so essentially my parents were making me follow through with my commitment and their commitment to me as a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting as I, I went through that with my daughter who, and this was that she was an athlete, but this was outside of athlete. I think she signed up to do, it was some play or something, some production, but it was, it was extensive and especially she was pretty young. And so she signed up, this was the second year she was going to do it. And then, a couple weeks into it, she wanted to quit. I wanted her to to go with it and to show like your commitment level. No, if you commit to something, you have to see it through. But then my wife was like, no, it's like, if she really doesn't want to do this, let's not make her. So there's the two things. Ultimately, my, my wife and my daughter won. But yeah, you're, as a parent, you always have that conflict of wanting to respect what hopefully their their inner wisdom is saying about themselves like no i really need a break versus trying to teach them something at the same time and i imagine you went through that exact thing yeah yeah and i mean like my my parents gave up a lot i mean the, the family split up i i moved away my mom was in a different state from my dad you know then i moved away by myself and not to mention the amount of money and all that stuff that's involved um it, that's that's just a lot, you know? So, mm -hmm. so it all makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. But yeah, it would have been curious. Like you said, you, f you feel like that year off would have served you justice. Obviously you you'll never know, but it would have been interesting to, to find out like, you know, would have helped you probably recover mentally and maybe gone in with more discipline, you know, and more focus. Yeah. I, I think my, my freshman year of college would have been, would have been a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, that really just wasn't my path. Mm -hmm. And, um, and if I had taken that year off, maybe I would have lost my scholarship and never gone to college. So, yeah. um, all in all, it was what was supposed to happen, I guess. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Totally. So tell us more of what was supposed to happen and what did happen. You decided not to go out for the Olympic team for the 2000 Olympics, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, I just after a long college season and no other college athletes for gymnastics at that time ever did, went back to international or club gymnastics. 
um, in the in the middle of their their college commitment. Um, and I was having such a good time in college, competing with with the team and really bonding with them and competing every single weekend. And by the time season's over, I mean you've got you've got eight to ten meets and you know, a three month period. So your body's really broken down. And the last thing you want to do is is train for another Olympic game um, or take that commitment on and increase your training. Uh, So I actually waited until I was completely done with college. Um, My last year was 2001 or my last year of eligibility. And after 2001 college season was over, I went on to make national team. And I think I finished third uh, and I went to, I was on the 19, sorry, 2001 world championship team. um, And I was a team captain of that team. I was pretty proud of and the oldest one on the team. And we also won a bronze medal. Hmm. So um, I think I was 20, 22 or 23 at the time. Um, and then from 2001, after that, I just, I decided I wanted to continue to train and try to make the 2004 Olympic team. So I continued training. I had my fifth year of school as well that I was doing. Um, and in 2002, I actually ended up dislocating my elbow at nationals, Mm. um, on a release move on bars during, during warmups or timed warmups. And after that, I, I retired for a year. Um, I just thought maybe, maybe this isn't for me. Um, I need, you know, I I was injured. I had to let my body heal. Um, I was also frustrated with, um, the way that USA gymnastics handled my, my injury and, um, was, was very, I guess, put off, um, because I, basically dislocated my elbow at nationals. I'd been a national team member for almost, you know, 10 years prior. And I, the next day when the girls were competing, I wasn't even allowed to sit, sit on the floor with the kids that were competing. They made me sit in the stands and I was really upset about that, you know? Um, and like, that was kind of the end of it. Nobody talked to me, nobody said anything to me. Um, and so, so, when I decided to retire, it was because I was really fed up with, with the situation and the way I was being treated and how long I had done gymnastics for and the years on national team. Um, I felt like that could have been handled better. So, so I ended up for, for that year, um, I bartended and a cocktail waitress and I delivered pizza. Um, and I took some other, some other classes in school and, about about a year later i just had this realization after you know working these just ungodly hours up until 3 a.m i was just like this is not my life there's something so much bigger and better that's out there for me and i just can't see myself doing this um and so i wanted to get back into training um so it was literally a year to the date of opening ceremonies or prior to the opening ceremonies of 2004, that I decided to come back and try to make the 2004 Olympic team after mm-hmm. taking an entire year off. Wow. So I imagine you weren't in peak condition at that point. Um, no, I wasn't in the best <laughs> shape <laughs> at all. And, and it took some time um, to, to get back into shape. But when you do those, when you do the same skills and the same routines repeatedly year after year, and you did them for, you know, twenty-ish years, um, you just have to start from basics and build up your strength, and everything kind of comes back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, I'm starting to see see it now that you eventually did get your year off that you were looking for, just at a different time in your life. I did. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, now, now it's normal. I mean, Simone took an entire year off and then she came back and she's doing the triple double. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so, so it is, it's, it's acceptable for, I feel like high level athletes to be able to do that if they need it. I just wasn't ever allowed or able to do it when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like it really did work out as a benefit for me when I was training that year. 
all the other girls that I was competing against, they've been training for this whole quad since, since, since 2001. And we're getting into, you know, the beginning of 2004, around that time. And these kids are beat up and they're injured and they're hurting. And I had just had a year off. So my body felt, felt fresh. It felt, mm. felt great. I didn't have any nagging or aching injuries. Um, and I am prone to elbow dislocations. I had a couple in college. I have very loose joints. And interestingly enough, when I had dislocated my elbow and they put it back in, I think the scar tissue and the ligament tightened. And so my elbow was actually in better shape huh. than it was before I had gone into um, 2002. Mm -hmm. wow. um, so, so I feel like I got lucky um, on that end of it. Um, I also had a completely different, my, my coach had a completely different training style or um, plan for me than when I was younger. I wasn't working out 42 hours a week. Mm. Um, my coach that coached me, I had three, but was Chris Waller. Um, he's now the head coach at UCLA. He was my coach during the Olympics and he was also uh, a UCLA athlete and a 92 Olympian. And so he trained me more like they do in men's gymnastics, where it's not routine after routine after routine and beating up your body. Um, it's more strength and more basics. And I didn't need to do these pounding high level skills every single day because I'd done them for, you know, 20 years. And then we did a lot of cross training. I did a yoga class almost every morning. Um, I did weight, weightlifting in the weight room um, and, and stuff like that. So I was able to, instead of spending 42 hours in the gym, I was spending maybe like 15 and then, you know, hours outside doing stuff that was fun that I enjoyed doing. Um, so it made my training a lot more enjoyable. Um, I think it also made my training in the gym that much more important. I think I talked earlier about how when I was younger, I didn't really do a good job of connecting mind body. I feel like through doing yoga and then not constantly being in the gym and doing other things, my time in the gym was really precious. So every single turn really counted, you know, and I knew I, this was probably going to be my last opportunity to, to make an Olympic team. So every single time I did something, I just told myself that I had to do it to the best of my ability, because when I look back on this, no matter what, I don't want to regret anything. I want to know that I put everything into it. So if I don't accomplish my goal, I can still feel satisfied and, and happy to, to walk away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's essentially being present and in the moment. That's what your drive was, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it was like, it was a very stressful time because I was 25 years old. Um, at this point, my, my dad wanted me to, to be done with this gymnastics nonsense and, and get a real job and go to law school. Um, so, so my dad wasn't paying for my apartment, wasn't paying for my training or any of that stuff. So during a lot of my early training, I was still working at the pizza place. I was still, you know, doing the bartending thing. Um, and so, so that, that was difficult, you know, and then I'm just thinking, like my, my coaches volunteered and I didn't pay them. So I was very stressed out about what if I'm doing all of this and I don't accomplish my goal and I owe everybody all this money. And, you know, so, so there was a high level of stress with that. And I think the one thing that my coach did a really good job of was um, to kind of deter that and really focus on it's not the outcome, it's the journey, it's the experience of doing all of that. Um, mm. And, and to really be present and enjoy that. And that's again, being, being present. So I think, I think all of this ties into just being an older athlete and being a little bit wiser and just an older young adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, you know, I, I said this earlier in the interview that in gymnastics, it seems like the younger, they're the ones that are peaking early, but they're still so young developmentally and I, I, yeah, I think for sure with your 25, obviously you're, you're going to be more advanced cognitively and emotionally than the others. 